good morning. How lovely it is that we're all here together. Thank you to the organizers. Can everyone hear me? OK. Um, I'm going to be reading, because this is a new presentation. I'm pretty sure that no one in this room needs to be convinced of the power of the arts to deepen our understanding of and connections to the beauty and the challenges of the world. Engaging with art, whether receiving it or making it, can connect our head, our hearts, and our hands, our bodies, to help us engage with what matters to us and with what we want to change as individuals, in community, and in organizational settings. The arts can also nurture larger systems change. This morning, I hope to connect a range of perspectives and possibilities that are shared by two communities. People working in the field of art for social change, and people working in social enterprise and other forms of social innovation. I will suggest a case for deeper collaboration between these sectors, and I'll challenge us to think about our work within a broad social and political wide shot not a close-up, one that's more encompassing than perhaps other frames of reference. It's easy and some would say completely reasonable to become cynical, pessimistic, and even paralyzed as our planet is pillaged, as we, our democracies, including our own, are dismantled at lightning speed, and we drown in a sea of consumerism. But we also know that a groundswell of new initiatives are creating positive ways for people to move from bemoaning the state of the world to imagining how it could be and taking concrete action to achieve it. Speaking of imagination, please stand up. <laughs> this will not hurt, don't worry. OK, I'd like you to raise your right arm, put your elbow in, point forward. Now, without moving your feet, move to the right, turn to the right as far as you can, and identify the place that you're pointing to. So just turn and point without moving your feet, and, <laughs> and come back to the front, and lower your arm. Now, please close your eyes. What I'd like you to do is to imagine that you're doing exactly the same thing, but this time don't move a muscle. Please close your eyes. So in your imagination, only lift up that arm, and now you're turning and you're going exactly back to where you were, and now you're coming back to the front and you're lowering your arm. Keeping your eyes closed, I'd like you to do this again. This time, go a bit further. So you're raising your arm, not moving, you're going to turn, 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 go a bit further, go a bit further, go a bit further. Come back to the front and lower your arm. Last time, still eyes closed. I want you to do something in your imagination that's absolutely impossible. Go 365 degrees all the way around to the front. OK, ready? Arm up. Don't move. Turn, turn. You're at the back now. Turn. Oh, you're at the front. OK, now come right the way around, all the way back to the front, and lower your arm. Please open your eyes, lift your arm for real, and go as far as you can. All righty then, and please sit down. I have a question for you. What happened? Who went further? Hands up. Wow. OK. No wrong answers. Why? Why did that happen? Possibility. Possibility. Visioning. What else? Imagination. Imagination. What else? Challenge. Challenge. What Belief. else? Belief. Belief. And you connected your head and your body. Big deal. Big deal. This is just a silly little game that exemplifies that connection and the power of the imagination to go further than where you think you might be able to go. I'm going to ask another question. Hands up. Who, I want to know who's in the room. We should all know who's here. Who identifies as an artist? Hands up. Good. As a social innovator? Good. Who works in social enterprise? 
Among the artists, who among you are working in community settings? Look around as the hands go up. Who's working in business settings? Thank you. Any educators? How about public policy makers? Are there policy people in the room? Great. Administrators. Great. Anyone working for a corporation? Great, thank you. Are there politicians in the room? Nary A1. OK, interesting. Who has English as their first language? Who does not have English as their first language? How many people are parents? Grandparents. Who identifies as an artist, as an activist? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So what does this very simple mapping of the room make you think about? What does it make you think about? <laughs> We've been prepped. Yeah. Any other ideas? Yes. Who's missing? Who's missing? Louder? Well, there are no politicians in this gathering, right? Yeah. One more. No wrong answers. Intersectionality. Intersectionality. OK. So we know a little bit about who's in the room. So what is art for social change? It has many definitions and many forms, and many variations exist on a continuum. I like to think of the field as having two basic forms. In the first form, the art of socio-political commentary is contained in the, com in the content of that artist's work or that group of artists' work. So it's the artist's work. Today, I'm talking about a second category. In this form, the artist acts as a catalyst and facilitator with members of communities who may not self-define as artists themselves. Using arts-infused processes, which are specialized processes, the artists or artists work with groups to create art themselves together. Art that is often focused on a particular topic or concern about what matters to them. It has many names. Community arts, community cultural development, animation culturelle, social arts, and Arts for Social Change, ASC, just to name a few, and each one with its own nuanced approach. ASC work is often rooted in issues of social, political, and environmental justice. This collective art making engages both the senses and the mind, and in itself is a form of social innovation. It generates dialogue insight and action through the creation of metaphor. And often this process is more important than the art product itself. With this approach, change can happen on many levels. And they're all interconnected. At the micro or personal level for individuals, at the meso level with or across communities and organizations, and at the macro level for policies or systems change. Where would you find ASC work in Canada and around the world? In health promotion, research, and training, huge. It's the greatest, the fastest uh, growing field in Canada. In work for social, environmental, and economic justice, with youth, seniors, immigrant populations, in the reclamation of and celebration of heritage and history, in intercultural and intergenerational work, in strategic planning processes, in urban development, in economic development, and in conflict resolution. Or it can simply be about what it is to be me. ASC is another form of social innovation. Here's some examples of the work, just to sort of ground some of my assertions here. In Toronto, a group of breast cancer patients who were very unhappy with their treatment in a local hospital worked with an ASC facilitator to create a play about what happened to them in that hospital. 
They performed it for everyone who worked at that hospital, and as a consequence of that performance, policies were changed. They then took it on a tour around uh, Ontario, and other hospital policies were changed. In Montreal, a program with youth who had, uh, were challenged in various ways, dropouts mostly from schools, a partnership between arts people and education people and job creation people, a multilateral partnership which enabled these young people uh, to uh, begin to enter the workforce. Very successful project. Stephen Leeflor works with hip hop and uh, various other kinds of art processes, and he's now working in prisons, working with incarcerated uh, male uh, um, people and uh, having huge success. There was a project in uh, California in 150, uh, there were 150 artists employed by uh, Bill Cleveland many, many years ago. And the reason he was able to keep the program going for 20 years was that they were able to prove that the recidivism rates went way down as a consequence of having done these art processes. Overseas, well, let's, let's go to Vancouver. David Diamond works on some of the hardest issues in our society. And he works in a, a field called uh, uh, Theater of the Oppressed. It's a theater for living. Um, and uh, it's, mo it's mostly theater work, but out of it comes policy recommendations for various uh, governments and uh, agencies. So working on issues of homelessness, addiction, gangs, uh, very, very effective work, and he works all over the world. Speaking of over, over the world, uh, overseas, El Sistema, huge music program in Venezuela, now about 32 years old, uh, funded by the uh, federal government, uh, takes kids and uh, older uh, youth uh, to do music work uh, and uh, develop interpersonal skills, all kinds of uh, 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 adjacent skills to actually making music. There's a peer learning system there, so they work with educators. Very, very effective. Colegio del Cuerpo in, uh, in Cartagena, in Colombia, uh, uh, Alvaro Restrepo uses the body as a central form of education and uh, the development of well-being, mostly for street-involved kids. Um, now a huge uh, uh, installation, a, a huge theater and educational uh, uh, venues for, for young people to learn in a different way through their body. In South Africa, well, I won't go on and on. I work a lot in the Global South. So a last one, Vidya in Ahmedabad, in Gujarat. Uh, a truck rolls into uh, a marketplace. This is always, almost always in the slums. The side of the truck comes down to create a stage. <laughs> Women who, who live and work in the slums prov uh, pr uh, perform theater, music, dance about their human and economic rights. Standing right by at the edge of the stage are resource people who provide programs to help people who want to address those issues in their own lives. Just a few examples. This is territory where reflection is key. Art making requires us to stop, to give us time for exploration. To use a current concept, we live in a time of affective capitalism. Some, somewhat similar to Noam Chomsky's idea of manufactured consent. Information is pre-processed for us. The consequence is a deficit in our ability to pay attention and to reflect. Making art is different, whether telling stories, creating a play, dancing dreams and fears, or creating a strategic plan. It all demands intentional focus. These moments give us time for deeper understanding and analysis of our experience and possibilities. And in a group setting, imaginative empathy becomes possible. I love that phrase, imaginative empathy. This approach to art making has a number of characteristics. Openness to that the endpoint of the process is unknowable. A requirement for high levels of group facilitation and dialogic skills high tolerance for risk and ambiguity, 
and often partnership with other organizations. Does this sound familiar to social entrepreneurs in the room? Let's be artful. I'm going to ask you to do something at your tables. I'd like one person at the table to make a shape in the air, maybe with a sound. And I want everybody to repeat it with that person copying them. So I'm going to do it at this table. Can people see? Can you guys stand up just as an example? So I'm going to make a shape, and I'm going to make a sound. Okay? And then I want you to copy me as I do it a second time. You ready? Okay. You can't think. That's the rule. <laughs> Zip. Zip. Thank you. I want each of you to do this around your table. Okay? Don't think, but just copy. Ready? Who's going to start at each table? Hand up. OK. Go. What happened? No wrong answers. What happened? People giggled. People giggled. What else happened? I said, um, pass, and then everybody at my table said, um, pass. <laughs> <laughs> so people were really listening to what you were saying. So real, real, real listening happened. What else happened? Yeah. There was a kind of musical rhythmic thing that happened. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Release of tension. Yes, it's OK to be silly. Yeah. This is just one of hundreds and hundreds of arts-infused facilitation methods that are being used in ASC all around the world. So let's look at another sector. Creative and innovation has become a catchphrase, a trope used in many settings. But fresh alternative ways to do business, think of share economies, B corporations, community-driven economic development, and the revival of the commons have all developed because of outside-of-the-box thinking. These approaches often include an acceptance of experiment and exploration. As with ASC, much work in the alternative business sector is grounded in a commitment to social and environmental concerns and involves new patterns of collaboration across professional silos. Last year, I attended a high-end, large international social enterprise conference. Among hundreds of scheduled events, not one focused on arts and culture. When I started asking delegates if they were involved with arts and culture, I discovered that quite a few were, and many expressed a strong desire to connect more deeply with artists in their organizations. And this is not an isolated situation. This takes me closer to my argument that a panoply of opportunities for knowledge exchange and collaboration between our two sectors are available to us, but at present are largely unrealized, although growing very quickly. Indeed, uncomplimentary labeling still occurs. Selling your soul to the devil if artists get involved with business. And categorizing artists as difficult, impractical, or frivolous. To be fair, for people outside of the world of business, some terms and concepts can seem impermeable. Hybrid structures and value change, cost-benefit analysis and ROI, shared value concepts, triple bottom line, social profit, but very often, the underlying principles of our work are the same. We need to share our languages. 
In addition to a high tolerance for risk and the use of collective processes to nurture creative ideas in the fields, what are some other parallels? Both sectors create new forums for expression, discussion, and collaborative inquiry, as well as space for alternate visions. We provide tools and settings for both personal and public expression and for participation. We create networks and enable cross-sector uh, participation. And we encourage enlightened public policy. We create social capital. Innovators in both sectors build community capacity and suggest new visions of what the world might be. I just realized I skipped a page. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is half an hour. I'm just warning you. Um, it may be useful to tell you something about how I came to recognize the importance of exchange and collaboration between our two sectors. I'm a dancer, choreographer, and producer, and come from an activist background. Much of my own creative work has been rooted in an exploration of social justice and other social issues. I was an early feminist. In the early 90s, I found myself in an inner city high school. I was about to be the mother of a teenage daughter. Our daughter was turning 12 at the time. And this was not the high school I grew up in. I'm 68. And I got curious, both as a mother and an artist. And that led to 18 years of work on three five to six year projects with youth. The ICE project looked at the issues that lead to, lead to teen suicide. The FIRE project at how youth experience violence in their lives. And the EARTH project was an international project that looked at issues of social and environmental justice. Each project contained uh, uh, hundreds of uh, participants, youth participants in workshops, about 400 in each of them, the creation of all kinds of uh, performance piece, television work, and many partnerships with other organizations. Because we are collaborating, well, right now I find myself a, a researcher. I'm, I'm the PI on a five-year Shirk project, which is the first uh, research study on art for social change in Canada, working with about 40 partners and, and six universities. During the period of my work with youth, because we were collaborating with so many youth-centered organizations across the country, I became curious about the connections between our work and change work in other contexts. One of those was the then fledgling social innovation movement. In 2006, when I carried out a global study of 46 ASC organizations, these connections became even clearer. I began to see the real parallels between our two fields. And it's around that time that I became connected with the social innovation field and later became an Ashoka Senior Fellow. So we were talking about partnerships. Let me give you just two examples of uh, really uh, good partnerships between social enterprise and artists, ASC organizations. In South Africa, uh, Kim Berman runs an organization now about 32 years old called Artist Proof. They are a social enterprise, very high end, that um, uh, produces printing for uh, artists and other businesses in Southern Africa. She also runs co-ops in rural villages for women to make the paper that they use. The proceeds from that social enterprise go towards extensive work all over South Africa to, to reduce HIV AIDS stigma. In the Philippines, an environmental project from a theater company works with people to uh, educate them and have them uh, relate their own experiences around environmental issues, particularly the use of diesel fuel. And they have partnered with a bicycle organization that provides cheap bicycles. OK, I'm coming to my second point. At the same time as we see out-of-the-box solutions, we see increasing use of other often technocratic systems for innovation. I strongly believe that these approaches in the end are less important than the perspectives, theories, and practices that underpin and guide our work. I believe it's essential to candidly examine our motivations. The power of coalitions and collaboration surfaces for me over and over as a central theme. And for me, collaboration absolutely demands that we ask many questions. 
some of them ethical, moral, and political, often complicated ones. For example, if you seek to deliver an arts product or experience, a new form product or service, who needs to be present as you define goals and strategies? Who needs to be in the room? Whose voices, whose stories are present, especially if you're to challenge systems of power and control that serve the few? How do we best create dialogue with people with whom we fundamentally disagree? Do we even try? If David Suzuki consults for Walmart, has he crossed a line? <laughs> when, well, we should talk about it. When organizations such as the International Money, uh, Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization very recently have started funding artists to work on attitudinal change to inform plans for large-scale development projects, are the artists being co-opted? Does it matter? If we want to provide practical, alternative ways of changing the world, I'm convinced it's critical that we talk about our work in relationship to the larger systems. How our, relate, how our work relates to society as a whole. How can we provide alternatives unless we examine the context within which our work occurs? What forms of power and control condition change work in neoliberal, corporate-dominated contexts? How do we revisit these perspectives if we want to scale up? I'm almost done. I'm not suggesting that we should feel compelled to work in any particular way, but rather that it's helpful, indeed necessary, to understand how our goals and their potential impact, big area for research, might be situated in micro, meso, and macro settings. Can you find common cause with those you don't agree with? People who challenge your thinking? How does reciprocity fit into the ways you work? How do you examine its social, environmental, political impacts? Is your work sustainable or hit and run? What skills, perspectives, approaches, methods can each of us offer to others? And finally, that old overarching question, who profits? There's so many paths to collaborative work. There's so many ways to break down old barriers and to imagine a better world. When we experience the world through the lens that the arts offer us, we, all kinds of new possibilities emerge. We're empowered, enriched, and enlightened. I end this presentation with quotes from two eminent sages. Dr. Seuss's Lorax says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And Snoopy says, <laughs> to live is to dance, and to dance is to live. Thank you. Shall we have uh, some discussion? Questions, observate, yes? Uh, how do we think about our work in the context of neoliberal, corporate-dominated societies? Okay, can I suggest something? Um, Please. I'm just really... I, I can you face the audience? Oh, really? So they can hear, yeah. Yeah, is there a mic? Is there a mic? I just, I just stand up. Oh, my God. <laughs> no risk, no risk. None at all. No. Hi, I turned it on. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, I just I, I feel a little I, I feel like this might be um, unpopular or like raining on a parade or something, but I just I feel a little suspicious whenever I hear the word innovation lately. And I'm a men member of the Center for Social Innovation, um, so it's I love it. Um, <laughs> Yvonne, are you filming me? <laughs> this is for just here. It's just between us, OK? Um, but anyways, I guess what I feel I'm suspicious of is the discourse around um, 
the individual artistic genius and the individual artistic entre or creative entrepreneur and how that is such an individualistic um, thing. And so I come, I, I have an arts organization, a business that I run as a business. So I learned how to be an entrepreneur and I, you know, uh, have developed my skills as an artist. Um, but what really informs my work is community organizing. Yeah. And that is, it just bugs the shit out of me that individual genius is going to save the world because it just ain't. And I'm absolutely with you. Sorry. <laughs> and that's why I'm advocating for looking outside the, the close up and looking at the wide shot to see where your work fits and where it can connect. Because so much of the work in Art for Social Change Community Arts stays there. It doesn't expand. And we have so many skills and, and so much knowledge, as, does, as do other sectors, and we're, there's no knowledge exchange, or not much at this point. Other parts of the world, there's a lot of stuff going on. But here in Canada, we're just a little bit further behind. This is a place where research can really provide you know, impact assessment, uh, teaching and learning opportunities. Uh, and and the, the pod that I'm interested in is the partnerships pod because of the whole uh, looking outside your own you know, field of vision. So I completely agree with you. Hmm. I don't want to stand up. <laughs> but uh, I come from the education sector mm. in the arts, and that's a gap that I too have seen. Mm. And the connection between um, efficacy in teaching methods and mm -hmm. preparing students mm -hmm. to get out there and get connected in their world, it's mm -hmm. their world, um, is it's almost insurmountable when there's so much emphasis on STEM. Mm -hmm. So the Rhode Island School of Design, yeah. several years ago, of course, launched the STEAM movement. And it is so slow, so slow to take shape here in Canada. Even the states, who've had a deplorable yeah. record in the arts in terms of education, are now uh, gaining more traction than we are. So it requires advocacy even amongst educators themselves. Yeah, and, and, and the conundrum is that we need evidence of impact. And that's our study is trying to, to look at that. Uh, our, our center is actually housed in the Faculty of Education at SFU. And there are all kinds of really interesting arts-infused educational models. Um, uh, Arnie April did this wonderful thing in Chicago. It's been going for 30 years. Um, so there are models. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And there are models that are applicable in the educational sector at both uh, elementary and high school and post-secondary levels. So we, it's, it's, it's just a question of will and the ability to, to have those dialogues um, with entrenched sensibilities. Yeah. Yes. stand up either. <laughs> I think I was the only hand who raised up and said, hi, I'm corporate. But um, just from a corporate perspective, yes. uh, 10 years ago, I was given permission to be an artist. Ooh. So up until it's through my youth, parents are great, art, round you out. Want to do it as a career? No. So you put yourself in a box. And I think a good message, and we're seeing articles about this as well, how creativity makes you a better business person. Sometimes a message that we have to give back to business is I know I'm, and I'm complimented on it at work. I'm more empathetic. I don't judge people. Mm. I'm more creative in how I solve problems. I'm known for that. People mm. hire me for that. Mm. So, and I completely give credit to being allowed to be an artist and being allowed to be, I think you mentioned being reflective, mm -hmm. create an environment where you may be put in an uncomfortable position mm -hmm. to look at other people or the people around you or think differently. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the message. When we talk about innovation and you talk about groups, and I love STEAM, I, I want to read up about this a little bit more. I think that's the message we should be giving back to corporate that they can actually understand. Yeah, there's a whole new industry in the States right now where people go in and they do art stuff and people feel really good for a weekend and then I call it a warm bath and then they go back. There are other things happening where artists are guerrilla infiltrating into other sectors including the corporate sectors. And uh, you know, there are old models where artists sit on city councils. In the UK, it happened for years. So I think things are beginning to change. There's this hunger for creative stuff in, in the private sector. 
And I know foundations are searching for ways to, to deal with all of this. Um, governments are also, some governments are looking at, you know, how to encourage um, uh, this, this, these forms of collaboration. And um, there's a new opening up um, of the possibilities for researchers to be working in this area. So I'm very optimistic right now. I've been working in this field. I, I, I'm, I'm nearly 70. And the last eight years or so, the doors are opening. And it's very, very encouraging. Somebody at the back. Yes. Um, I just I think it's interesting when people who don't necessarily identify as artists end up working in arts organizations as well. So a flip to that. I mean, when I was much younger, I did a very small stint at Bruce Mao Design, which you know was sort of that commercial art co marriage between the both. And the people who were project managers were actually biologists, and people who were working you know in the business side of things were actually had science backgrounds or had. Um, you know, so bringing in business people into the arts and not having such a closed idea of what an artist means, I think often we pigeonhole ourselves as well as pigeonholing others and being more open to the creativity of people who work in other sectors is really, really an important lesson as well. And I'm going to pass this right next door. I think it's about knowledge exchange at this point, just getting to know each other and figuring out if there is connectivity. Sometimes you shouldn't be working with the other person or the other organization. And that's where arts facilitated, arts infused facilitation is so useful because you're not talking at each other. You're actually creating art together where you can use uh, uh, these forms to have a different kind of communication through metaphor. I'm creating a, 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 a art and culture plan for the West End of Vancouver right now. And we've had hundreds of people involved in arts projects and out of those facilitated arts workshops, we have, we're, our plan is emerging. So there are all kinds of ways for including artists in, this, in these change agendas. So we didn't talk before, but interestingly, our <laughs> comments align. Um, I actually have a science background and I'm now doing a program at OCAD in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. Mm. And one of the things that, from this talk, is that I hear a lot of, it seems to be like STEM versus arts, or at least it's being framed that way. And I think there's a huge opportunity for blending those. And perhaps, I'm, I just Googled STEAM, so perhaps that's what that's about. But I think it's really important to think about um, how scientists inherently need to be creative to be effective, and how we're divided as children. And this is something personally where I've just started to learn, oh, there's actually creativity in me that I had no idea about. So I just wanted to. It's a if big movement that, that of you know, uh, c connecting ar the arts and science communities. Um, one of our projects on our research project is a study on Parkinson's. And the people who are working together are a neuroscientist and an artist, working with about 40 people now for two years. People who, whose faces have unfrozen, who can now walk across the room. And she's doing neurological testing to see what, what happened. So it's, it's happening, and uh, very, very strong in the UK with all the plasticity, brain plasticity work that's going on now, lots of new findings around dementia, all kinds of areas where um, uh, uh, th those collaborations are, are happening. So it's very exciting. But we have to reposition our, our, our thinking. Last one? Or can we go on? Yeah, we were when we started. <laughs> Can I take one more? Yeah, one more. OK. Who, who's urgent? You're urgent in the blue. I wanted to speak uh, briefly to uh, what you said at one point, the question of who profits in various situations, because there's always moments of appropriation, right? And we, I wonder if also a different question to ask or to pose as a sort of a counterbalance to that who profits and the, the ongoing challenge of having your work, collaborative work, always kind of appropriated within structures that look for uh, consumption or you know, produce the next new gadget or what have you, is how do you put in place or how do you work to what, towards putting in place um, structures for uh, com common caring for what you're doing mm -hmm. and for what you're creating and checks and balances. Uh, and the big systemic problem is that we are working in an economy of scarcity. 
right? We are all competing for the same scarce funding, or we have to pe put piece together different funds from different sources. Mm -hmm. And that is an economy of scarcity. That is an economy that atomizes and that, you know, That's does right. that genius, individual genius kind of thing. And I think that sort of the great challenge uh, is indeed to, uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a, a shift in values. Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. And the money thing is always there to remind you, money speaks faster and cleaner than anything else because all, all the, everything else is messy. Mm. But if we actually try to kind of, we're trained on the critique of power, mm. a lot of us I assume, mm. uh, but then when we are articulate, or we try to articulate power as care, mm. maybe something changes? I, don't, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Ashoka is now using the term empathy as a central core value. Yeah. I know. It's, it's, it's effective capitalism, right? Yeah. That's how it's... it's, yeah. Really, it's yeah. One of the things that some people do when they're developing partnerships, is there's the who's in the room question right at the very beginning, but there's also the collective development of protocols, agreed upon protocols, and there are various arts-infused methods to develop these protocols that are written down, and if, if there are problems, you can go back to it. Now, the problem with that is sometimes people who are leading the projects leave, and so you have to have institutional buy-in to those protocols as well as the agreements between individuals. But what I'm talking about is what you're talking about, a real shift in values about what is your theory of change? What are you changing? Why are you changing it? Who needs to be there? How do you measure it? Do you want to sustain it? I mean, there's all these basic ethical questions about these forms of work that I think we really need to be asking right from the beginning. Thank you all so much.